Betty, hey, we haven't had anything up on the collab for a while. Co uh, Think Collaborative on YouTube channel. So we're doing a Think Collaborative this morning. And the topic in conversation is going to be in and around time. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, so we're all good. Hoot, hoot. <laughs> All right, who wants who wants to start? Why don't you start by introducing everybody? Oh yeah, hey, that's a great idea. We have uh, Dr. Lenny Time on today, uh, Bridget Lindolgoff, and also we have um, Stellium Seven YouTube, and we also have Ryan Hunter on board. Okay, I'm happy to start. Um, I've done a lot of thinking about time, and I'm pretty certain that time is a function of frequency, but that the relationship that science has given time and frequency is not a valid relationship because frequency depends on time, and time is measured in terms of frequency, and that's something that you can't have. You need one of the variables. I mean, if if one variable depends on the other and the second depends on the first, then what you're talking is about a locked circle and nothing can have influence. So our concept of time that we've been using is rather broken. And so I've been doing a lot of thought about what the real chemistry of time would be. And so I'm looking forward to this conversation because it'll allow me to bring out some ideas that need to be kicked around some to get things so that we really do understand this thing we talk about time. And I think it depends on scale. And I'm pretty sure that Stellium 7 has hooked into a key feature of understanding that is missing from conscious thought today. So hopefully we'll get down that rabbit hole. Yeah, that'll be fun to talk about. I have a narrow, um, narrow range of knowledge when it comes to matters of time and, and these kinds of topics, but I do have a little bit of a, a segment that I, I think I can Well, um, feel free to trot that out now, or I did uh, suggest the topic, and I don't mind uh, launching in. As, as usual, I know Lenny's listened to some of my shows with Bridget, so I'm coming at it from a, a much more abstract kind of viewpoint, but um, let's start with, you know, reality, our world. Right? Because, I mean, I think everybody in the conversation, probably most of the people that are going to be listening, have a, a certain sense of how we assemble our perceptions and construct our perceptual reality. And, um, right, so. What's going on? I mean, this, this is one of those those physical questions. I remember being a physics student uh, in my early undergrad, uh, having this epiphany that um, space was not real because any experiment, any physical interaction that could evince the concept that we talk about as space. Well, the interaction is just the interaction. It's just energy. Energy exchanging over time or, or whatever uh, you care to frame that as, but um, because it's an abstract interaction, who knows what we're talking about? Um, maybe it's a photon. Maybe it's everything that you perceive to be real has to be assembled together into the perceivable reality that you inhabit. And the one characteristic that is truly fundamental 
to this um, to this construction that we create, this interpretation of what reality is that we make for ourselves to to dwell in is um, is time. But time itself is an aspect of thought. And this is one of those things um, with shamanism, or, or if you go out to some of these places, you can actually, um, well, as you broach the third attention, you will, you, your, the moments will become unglued. The uh, cohesivity of time fails. So time is not actually uh, an aspect of experience itself. Each moment can exist in isolation as a standalone experience. The fact that we string them together in a chronology is something extra. And, um, and that involves thought. On some level, time is an aspect of our conscious thought, or even subconscious thought. But it's... Um, it's kind of got some structure to it. It's more than just your basic awareness. And um, especially this chronology thing, because, okay, we learn to assemble our, our perceptions into some uh, semi-useful reality that we can then interact with. But as we do that, we get informed, we get inculcated into certain ways of thinking, and our uh, reality gets formed you know, externally for us, also by a, a variety of influences, most notably, you know, family, social influences, whatever. But before any of that happens, we have time. We have this signal or frequency, however you like to conceive of it, but we have this thing being broadcast into our our heads. And the reason that I that I've Started. Uh, I wanted to talk about time today, and that it's become my new obsession. Time is that um, it's it's recently become clear to me that we're not meant to be living in a chronology. That's much more limited than what humans are meant to even be, because time is not something that is one dimensional. Time is fractal in nature, in fact, and if we were to heal our time stream, I'm just going to use that, even though that sounds very one-dimensional and very, you know, trapped in a flow, like we typically think of time, it's bigger, and if we heal our time stream, because that chronology is a fractured time stream that keeps us stuck, keeps us stuck in these loops, keeps us stuck in what Bridget... Bridget has been talking about creating your own personal hell on earth lately, then that's that's exactly the chronology that people construct. Just just the lowest level of experiencing this material plane. But there is all sorts of probability. Just like the other like the dreaming plane has le- levels, the the astral plane has levels, the material plane has levels. They're just not as apparent. Because they're probability. That's that's what exists here. Is um, I, I mean, go back to uh, Douglas Adams, space time and probability, um, because it's true. What happens is there is a there is a, an expanse of possibility that defines what each one of our lives actually is, and we live this tiny little section of it that we string together in a chronology and whether we have a happy time or a sad time the fact is that is much more limited than we should ever actually be and we um by by disengaging from time by by um well by abandoning the outcome right we have to have that detachment we can't be concerned with what's coming or we're just grasping onto that chronology that we're trying to let go of. But as we can move away 
and become detached, we can actually open up our perception of time. This is my project. And I'm at the very beginning of trying to understand time, but this is really why I wanted to talk about it. So let's hear from somebody else now. <laughs> Lenny, could you expand a little more on this time relationship to frequency idea that you started with? I'd, I'd just like to hear more about that. Yeah. OK, I tend to look at things from the, the version of scale. And I've been working with a concept called human scale that works at the level of each individual human being and the collection of all the human beings together as the two limits of that human scale. And I realized that that human scale is a fractal of other scales that we can measure. I think Nassim Haraman said that there's over a hundred different scales in the continuum, and I've projected it out to be either 144 or 256, depending on how much math I feel like doing. And so if you figure that an order of magnitude is a power of 10, it's uh, 3.14 powers of 10 between one scale and the adjacent scale. And so adjacent scales are required to have 50% self-similarity because the borderline between two existing adjacent scales has to be similar to both. So likewise, if you jump to the next scale, smaller or larger, another 3.14 uh, orders of magnitude away, now the original scale to that outer scale has to have 25% self-similarity because it's half of a half. And the third jump gets you down to 12.5%, and that extra 2.5% gets taken up in the 0.14. So it's interesting how pi comes into the equation. Uh, phi, the phi ratio, the one that da Vinci used and the pyramids are built on and a number of other things in nature are based on, seems to be half of pi, although the mathematicians would really argue with me vehemently because the two numbers are close but not exact, but well within experimental error. Um, the frequency that is resonated as a function of time depends on the size of the scale, but I believe that humans exist on all different scales and our function of recognition of other human scales is what we're not getting. And so we can be on a scale where we're with other humans who are on a different absolute scale, but if we have this common narrative, it all seems like we're in the same place at the same time. But actually we're not, we're on our own scales that are modified by our brain frequency, which is in resonance with each other from different scales. So the 80 year human average lifetime that they tell us could be 80 years in a microsecond, or it could be 80 years in 26,000 years, like uh, the Mayan calendar that finished on 2012. But there's many Mayan calendars. It's a series of calendars, and I believe it follows the Fibonacci sequence. So there, it, it all comes back to the phi ratio and the mathematics that we think we understand that we've locked into human thought because the university academic system has told us that this is the way it has to be. But we know from what Ryan said and from our own independent thought that time doesn't work the way it was explained to us. And I think that 
frequencies that are in re within resonance of each other interlock into time frames. That being said, I think there are several different timelines that the narrative could take from this point of time, but we have to consider this point of time where we're talking as a singularity that's at least expressed by the four of us. So for the, the hour or two that we're going to be talking, we are in the same timeline discussing the same topic. But then when we go back to our separate realities, where those threads are, I think is a function of scale. Now, a different scale that is resonant with human frequency, but is a fractal of what humans are, is the water molecule scale. H2O, it's about 10 to the minus ninth in size from human scale, so it's not an adjacent scale. It, it's probably 3.14 scales away from where our scale is. So that would mean that there doesn't have to be more than 10% self-similarity, but we seem to be in the same resonance. So chemistry assigns resonances to bonds between different elements. In water, the elements are hydrogen and oxygen, and there's three degrees of freedom because you can imagine an HOH molecule as having a symmetric stretch, two asymmetric stretches were, which are equal and opposite, and then a twist in that bond angle. And three degrees of freedom is enough to store memory and hold consciousness. So the consciousness of water likely functions like the consciousness of humanity because they are resonant with each other and fractally related. But to find things that are fractally related on different scales, well... That's something that we need to explore. And so like the dream world might be other different fractals, but are accessing the dream world through a lucid dream or a nature walk or some way takes us into a different place that then requires us to come back to this place that we call the here and now. Um, I wonder if we actually have to come back or if maybe a group like uh, the Mayans or the uh, Hopi just changed their frequency and resonate in the same physical location, but at a frequency that we can't achieve off our current timeline. And when Bridget and I spent time at Mesa Verde, uh, we definitely encountered spirits that could communicate with the two of us at a way that we were absolutely certain they were there, but in physical reality, we caught the expression of energy and never got to actually meet in a physical reality. So there's a lot more to time than we perceive but I think we've got to get away from clocks and calendars to really understand the functions of time. Lenny, are you familiar with the, the old Star Trek episode where I, I can't remember the, the details of it, but the basic idea was that um, they were beings that were vibrating at a, at a frequency that was so, so fast that they were invisible. And, uh, you know, it was all about trying to determine what was happening between these basically different dimensions. Um, I don't recall the specific episode, but I've watched so many movies and television shows on time that I, I tend to mix things up in my mind to be a jumble. But right. Yeah, well, the, the, the idea being that people are moving around like like you're suggesting that you were talking about the the mayans and maybe that they've just shifted to a, a different vibration and they're they're actually still habitating the same the same places um but we don't perceive them because we're on this lower lower vibrational frequency 
Okay, well, yeah. I so, recall. Go ahead. Yeah, so I'll just tell a story, right? Um, because all I can do with time has come from, you know, like a place of all the spiritual teachers, you know, my native teachers and other people that I've studied with, you know, medicine and shaman people that bypass time and that can, we'll call it flicker in this reality and then flicker out <laughs> to another reality and take their bodies. Um, and I'll put two links in here too, and I'll talk about the mummified um, time thing as well, maybe towards the end, because it's pretty out there. But uh, in 2000, I think it was 2010, I got invited to go down to Pasadena um, to deal with a group of people who were highly involved with Don Juan and uh, a lot of that kind of lineage. Um, um, you know, like, you know, Carlo Castaneda talked about, but he wasn't allowed to actually talk about a lot of it and the other practitioners because they felt that he had a really big ego. And so they actually asked him not to talk about, you know, there are certain things not to talk about in the books that he wrote. But anyway, there's a lineage of people. So I got asked to go down. There was like 200 people. We were in a conference room for that they rented uh, for three days for us. Um, and we went down there and what we did was we did things called magical you would call them magical passes, but they're actually ancient art forms, physical forms that you do. And we were taught from some of these people, uh, an ancient form that had to deal with dolphins and whales and water. And so we did a lot of um, things like strumming the webbing in our fingers and our toes to activate the memory of uh, water, because they believe humans have um, all access to all this data and information in our bodies, because we're the evolution, basically, kind of of everything. So we just have to work on waking it up in the body. And then they taught us some magical passes that we did. And then we had to do a whole lot of emotional work for the first two days to release, you know, stuff in us um and each other so that we could bypass that system into more of a you know a third attention a more watery type um second attention more watery type to move into the deeper attentions so what happened was that once we all kind of got on the same boat all time and space started to cease to exist um, there were things, you know, firing in and out of what we call reality. And um, the last practice we did was we went outside, a group of us of 200 people, and we stood out in front of this huge uh, convention center. And we were assigned to only look at the place that we could look at on the building. That was our piece of the puzzle, of the physical puzzle. And we stood there and basically looked at that section for, I don't know, an hour maybe together, you know, lined up in three lines, taller people on the back. And that's all we did was stare at our one little section and took it all in, like all the pieces of it, right, in the reality, the picture, part of the puzzle. And then we were quietly led back in. And then one of the people that was Mayan or Aztec, I don't know if it was Mayan or Aztec descent. Hey, over here, come here. I have a dog problem. <laughs> dog and cat, dog and cat. <laughs> um, and we were taken in and we were told a story uh, that comes from her ancestry. And that, you know, these civilizations did not disappear because they come from these Toltec lineages, which are dreamers, right? Dreaming, which these people can bypass time and space with their physical bodies. So when they knew that in the future timeline that they were going to be looted, there's going to be potential of murder, um, that, you know, all kinds of things were going to happen, um, there were like, you know, 500,000 people that would come to these city centers that they had and they would all sit 
for hours upon hours, and they would just look at one piece of the city center for days and hours and months. They practiced because what they were going to do is they were going to bypass time and space, and they were going to take everybody with them into another dimension that was aside this dimension. But they also wanted to take their city center. They wanted to take their food systems. They wanted to take all of this other stuff so they could reconstruct their perfect reality that they had here over there. And so that's kind of like the lesson over three days was, you know, it's very difficult to try to construct this kind of a reality by yourself. And that given we were all given these really simple practices to actually construct this reality together as a group. And so that we had at least the information and the understanding and knowledge within us so that when we left this, you know, meeting and group and teaching that that could continue to grow within us. Right. And maybe how we could adapt this or do this, you know, later on. But these practices are tough. You know, these practices are not where you can just, you know, I'm going to do it, blah, 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 because, you know, in order to do it as a whole community or as a whole or together, you have to be synced up, which means you have to be on the same vibration. You know, you have to be creating the same frequency, which means that the physical practices are super essential because you have to actually create a strong body to do this um, work. And that actually helps the practices actually help to raise the frequency and the vibration of the body and every all the totality of it. But they're tough. That's why they have these things called the shamanic death, because you're constantly having these death experiences, these, you know, overwhelming panic and anxiety attacks as you're moving through these practices, because you have to let go of everything that you've ever thought, right, or been a part of or existed in. So anyway, I just throw that out because you know, I, don't, I don't have a background you know, in chemistry or anything like that. So all I can do is kind of talk from a shamanic standpoint of what I've learned and been taught by people of these lineages. Yeah, I mean, the difficulty there is gaining independence. The problem is um, that we are doing that. I want to talk about the signal of time, right? This signal, and if you listen to David Icke, maybe it's coming physically, literally from Saturn, or however you want to think. Kronos, uh, the demiurge, this tyrant. We have the, we embody this signal of time into this, you know, malevolent deity. Um, but it's really us. At the same time, it's really us projecting this time, projecting all the ins and outs of this physical reality and its brokenness and everything. Um, the reason that it's hard to project something else is because you have to get out of this. And the problem with this, and I was talking about this, um, this broken time stream, but we're talking about these emotional practices. Recapitulation. That is how you're going to to heal your personal time stream. Because those are the fractures. Whatever whatever those you know, whatever the trauma is, whatever the whatever it is you're drawn to recapitulate, to re examine, to question, those are exactly the things that you need to to heal your paradigm, to heal your perception, to heal your time stream. That's what I had on the back of that. Well, I think that we should talk to uh, Stellion Seven, have him explain what he's seen at Mount Go, because I think that's very relevant to our understanding of how time might really work. Mike, you want to give it a shot? Sure. Um... Yeah, well, first of all, it's it's Mount Go. <laughs> Mount Go. It, sound, it sounds like Mount Go, but it's M O N T G O. It's a it's a mountain here in Spain. Um, I think the the research that I've done on the mountain ties in a lot to what you were talking about before, Lenny, which is 
related to to the fractal nature of, of reality, and, and you can look at things on a on Marvel. Uh, looking at the plants and see the way it Hey, Stellium, all of a sudden your bandwidth is kind of weird. It's kind of going in and out. Mathematical. You know, nature that we see. Oh, is it? Yeah, we didn't hear anything that you said really. It got, all got kind of stretched out. So. Maybe we should drop him from the call and bring him back in. Oh, I've lost what? the call. All right. Hey, no, you're here. Oh, there he goes. Okay, he's back. Switch to. Uh, You're still stretching out. Yeah. Oh, that sounds better. Okay. How about now? Is that better? Oh, yeah, way better. Okay. Okay. Go back oh, to what okay. you were saying because we didn't yeah, hear any of it. <laughs> Yeah, it was okay. So um, let's see. Um, going back to, to Mont Go, I think it's it's um, it, it's a topic that connects well to what you were talking about before, Lenny. When you were talking about the the fractal nature of reality, you were discussing the water mo molecule and these different levels of of existence that we that it, that we see, both on you know biological on the cellular level, on the molecular level going up to to our level and then we see these these reoccurring patterns existing all throughout nature that that are mathematical you, you know the fibonacci sequence the phi ratio um, so there's no doubt that that sort of thing is happening and and ryan mentioned before he was talking about space not being real and and uh i'm not <laughs> i'm not sure exactly what he meant by that but i always envisioned us going from the level that we're at, the human the human level and the plant life level, and that the next level was was the Earth level, and then beyond Earth we had the solar system and the galaxies and all these things. And so, so I had been fed this, um, you know, this this commonly accepted version of of the universe and how it's structured, and and I could see that there was this <clears throat> this fractal. Uh, pattern that was extending in both directions, but it never occurred to me that maybe there was a big chunk of that fractal pattern that was uh, completely missing or obfuscated. And um, and so that that's kind of where Mont Go comes into that that narrative, because I had been watching a lot of different um, videos and studying different topics on the on the subject of uh, mud fossils and uh, looking at geology and different uh, criticisms of some of the the mainstream geological narratives and what we think of as the cornerstones of of geology when it comes to dating, and um, those those subjects caused me to start looking around <laughs> at at you know the rocks around me and the mountains through different eyes. And this particular mountain that, that's here in Spain on the coast and it's, uh, in a town that I've lived in now for eight years, it's affectionately known as, as the elephant because it looks a heck of a lot like a, an elephant lying on its stomach with its uh, trunk extended forward. Um, all right, Stellium, you're stretching out again. Uh, I 
Earth to Stellium. All right. I think we've lost him. That's a shame. Can we get him back, Bridget? In the meantime, I've got some stones with me that really look like examples of some of the heart stones that Stellium has found. Here he okay. is. Stellium? <laughs> oh, good. We got you I'm back. On, I'm on Ethernet now, so this should not be a problem anymore. Okay. Sorry. Everybody Sorry was that. worried. They're like, get him back. <laughs> get him back. <laughs> So, okay, so I don't we know. Heard up to the mountain that it looked resembles an elephant. So that's where we heard. Right, too. right. Okay. So, um, so I started. Um, oh, I, I also um, I came across some videos where they were talking about the mythology of titans and tying that into mud fossil theory. And all of a sudden, I I started looking at the mountain, kind of sideways, going, "Wait a minute." <laughs> What if, what if there, what if there's more to it than than it just looks like a a creature? And uh, the thing is that there's a a giant cave which I had been in on a number of occasions, which is perfectly placed for an eye socket, and uh, the the head is shaped uh, very very much like an elephant's head, and the eye is exactly where it should be. So, I started um, I started off by by looking at the the mountain in 3d view on google earth and realized that there were a whole bunch of things that um that added up um early on that it, you know i always in in all of my videos i talk about the the idea uh, the concept of pareidolia and you know this this capacity that we all have to to recognize patterns even when there isn't necessarily a pattern there um, artists have it more than the average people, but it's something that um, we definitely will um, will do. And we can look look at clouds, we can look at you know patterns anywhere, and start to see faces and and other things. So, I as I started to look into this more and more, I said, okay, wait a minute, I'm not just gonna start looking for different things to try and you know justify my desire to to believe that this was actually you know a giant creature of some sort i'm going to approach this a little more rationally and scientifically and i'm going to come up with a list of of things that i would expect to find if there was any any truth to this because it seemed utterly crazy to me uh when i when i started to look into it and um the more i looked into it the crazier it got <laughs> This is an interesting concept. I, I kind of want to say a word here about this paragoia. You, um, of, of course, you know, it's a thought and it's um, a lot. We all understand. We all understand, except um, finding patterns where there. There's a problem with saying that there is no pattern. It's the same problem that we have with the concept of randomness. Uh, we can't ever say there is no pattern. And I mean, randomness is undefinable, right? Because if we could define it, it wouldn't be random, <laughs> right? If, if there was any way of getting a hold of what randomness should look like, then it would contradict the concept that we hold in our heads of what randomness is. Um, and for that same reason, when we talk about, you know, things being random or the universe being random, it doesn't really mean anything because randomness is not 
different from order. It's just, you know, when we look out at, at the, that space at what we think is, is so completely random. It's just the underlying level of order that exists in the reality. When you right, pick for... up on patterns and say that, oh, well, maybe I'm just seeing that and there is no pattern. You're not in a place to say there is no pattern. The pattern is there. <laughs> just because, you know, people may not understand why the pattern is there doesn't mean that it's not an actual pattern. Right. No, I get that, that something that appears to be random might actually be part of a system that you're not capable of, of understanding it, you know, based on your knowledge level or or at the level at which you're observing it. You know, weather is a perfect example of that. Um, you know, if you're just down looking up, you have no idea that there's, you know, a bigger superstructure in the form of some kind of a hurricane or something like that, and that there's very much a pattern and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. aspects of it that can be observed and predicted and that sort of thing. I'm talking about more like if you're looking up in a cloud and you see uh, what looks to be a, a, a horse or a dragon or, you know, something like that, then it, it, it's, you know, that would be a delusion if you were to assume that just because it looks that way that it really is a horse or a dragon. And so that's that's the nature of paradox. Well, that's not a well-founded could... assumption. <laughs> but well, there I may mean, there may be a reason there may actually be that's what that's what I'm saying is like that may be a manifestation of something of some pattern even though you don't understand it um and like the appearance of a dragon in particular may actually be um because again we think we think we live in a physical reality but we actually construct it all with our minds um, and there is a mental aspect to everything that is physical. Um, anyway, yeah, I mean, that's getting, that's, that's taking the point to, to, uh, well, down I a dark there's, alleyway, there's, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, our, our percept, there's this whole, you know, debate about whether we, we change reality by our act perception and, you know, the quantum the quantum approach to looking at things is that you can, you know, you can shape things with your your mind and your thinking and meditate on them. Well, what I'm talking about is much more basic, much more basic than that. So, I mean, you think you, I mean, okay, you look out the window, you think you see a car. Well, what is that? I mean, you've got, you know, millions of nerve endings that are, um, all your rods and cones are, are tingling, giving the sensation of, you know, points of color and, and light and dark and value and whatever. Photons are hitting, the, you know, there, there's all of the physics that we can extrapolate out of that. Except that. If we buy the physics, that is. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, that's just one explanation, but it's, it's, a, it's a way in. Because I'm not even really talking about physics right now. I'm talking about perception. Um, I thought we were talking about time. Yeah, well, time is perception. It's uh, without time. Well, that's not true. I would, there is perception without time, but uh, we don't have a we don't have a directed perception. We don't even have a chronology without time. Well, um, can I just, can I just I, I just like to bring it, bring it down yeah, to yeah. a very basic human level because um it, you know all of us experience the relativity of time. I mean, when you're bored, time moves very slowly, and when something is really fun, it flies by like like nothing. You know, and and that's something that we all experience. You know, every day of our lives for the most part is this this fluctuation of our experience of time. And going back to you know what uh, Bridget was saying about shamanism and the the dream world, you know this also ties in very deeply to psychedelics and how there are extreme you know warpages of of time and in, in the experience of of the person under the influence. So um, there's there's a definite relativity of time that's you know that's based on perception. Um, you know it relates back to. Um, you know this uh, this idea that we're just 
we're living a sliver of of a potential, a myriad of of different possibilities, like you oh, said yes. at the very beginning, Ryan, and and that mm-hmm. at every point there's this branching off of different possibilities, and um, it gets it gets very abstract and and difficult to to sort out. I when it came to the mountain, and uh, I heard Lenny as I popped back into the chat um, talking about the the heart stones. I was really trying to approach this study from a more empirical uh, place where I was looking at physical stuff around me that, you know, if I bang my head against it, it would hurt like hell and I would bleed, you know, (laughs) and, uh, and, you know, try and understand how that fit into geological timelines to the fractal, fractal nature of reality and, and what I've what I've learned in, in the course of doing that is that very likely much of what we've been taught about time as far as the official scale that we've been given by astrophysicists of 16.4 billion years and the Earth being four point something or other billion years, that that's likely a lot of hogwash. And things are probably uh, on a much much shorter time scale when it comes to at least what we see around us when we're looking at geology and and also the the nature of geology and and its its um its origins may be entirely different than what we were taught and that's that's really what my channel and my work is has been focused on i've been looking at stellian seven's work and I've had the chance to sit in a creek and pick up stones and various places that I collect things. And the chemistry of what would go on to change an elephant into stone is one of those things that we consider impossible in current chemistry. But I got to thinking about if an application of cold fusion could be made the silicon that is stone is just basically carbon fused with oxygen. So if the oxygen came from water and there was a light catalyst or an electrical catalyst, lightning, something that could actually make that fusion occur, the petrification of everything could be a hint as to the relationship of how time actually works in dynamics and that maybe the world of a giant elephant of that scale was the next larger fractal in the sequence that leads from water through macromolecules through microbes through organs up to humans and uh, animals plants and the stuff we see at this scale but I, I, I question some of the mythos that gets us to there. And I, the, the reality that has been painted for us by the system that we've brought un, been brought up on just doesn't hold water anymore, if you forgive my pun. <laughs> well, and that's the, that's the problem with it, is that, that this time, this signal that we've got is really, it's not even a, yes, it's something that we're collectively projecting, but it's a curse. It's like we're cursing ourselves with the time that we manifest actively. And uh, that's why I think it's an important topic. And that's why, you know, the Demiurge and and whatever the Kronos, these uh, names for the, this time and order deity that exists out there, you know, is usually seen as malevolent because um, it's not in training a good time, a good time for us to live in. Um, but when we heal those cracks, it becomes nothing. It becomes not just dilated time or, you know, whatever contracted. It becomes bigger, expansive. I, even the, the kind of guarding, um, Sorry, Stellium said I'm going to think something uh, reminded me of the, the Garden of Forking Paths kind of um, concept. 
I think even that is too limited. To me, time is expansive. It is, um, it's fractal in nature, but it's, it's, uh, dimension is above two. (laughs) Yeah, it's contractive and expansive at the same time, depending on which way you're looking at it in the form of scale. Well, I I think it's all you know. If you look at it as a as its own manifold, it's got all sorts of interesting. It's uh, it's folding in on itself. It does. It's got topology. It's it's a uh, it's not a straightforward thing. Um, but um, I, I do want to get back to this point because it's, it's come up a couple of different times. We're talking about why space isn't real. Why. Um, why time only exists in your head, why perception is constructed. And it's all, um, it's very, it's very simple. I mean, because all, every dimension only exists in your mind anyway. That's, that's all a dimension is, is a mental extrapolation. But it's based on our perception, right? So we can draw X, Y, Z coordinate axes on our physical reality because we see it we assemble our perceptions into this perceivable reality that has those kind of dimensions right what i'm saying is that you know color sound the basic uh stimuli the basic sensory data that we get in has nothing to do with space or distance or um, time. I mean, they, they may happen at a point in time. Time is a little different from space. Space is already encoded in time. Um, our perception of space, which we construct, right? We, we make our perceivable reality for ourselves. We're decoding time from our thoughts. And that time that's in our thoughts is expanding into, think about the matrix. This is a great, okay, so the original matrix movie. Now somehow all of four dimensional, three space, one time, all of of perceptual reality was encoded through this you know, this jack that they just shoved into the back of people's heads, right? It's like some one-dimensional data stream, just a string of ones and zeros that somehow becomes multidimensional in perception, right? It's because those dimensions only exist in our minds in the first place. We create those out of our sensory uh, stimuli. Did that help to explain my point about that? Um, When we have a, there's a disconnect between the mind and an apparent disconnect, uh, the mind and the physical, right? We want to talk about the physical, but we have to use this apparatus of our sensory organs and our uh, uh, central nervous system in order to get an interpretation of what the physical is in order to deal with it with our minds. And... um, But that whole process is basically what your mind does. That's what it's there for. (laughs) Um, I'm going to stop talking now and let other people talk, see see where that (laughs) leaves us. Well, one thing I would ask you is if we all have our own timeline created by the dimensions that we've thought up in our minds, how do we turn that into a consensus reality or how do we turn it into a dream state? Well, I think, you know, well, they're this, both the same thing. Yeah. So yeah, this winter I, you know, had the, I took uh, five different courses. Um, all of this started back like 12 years ago when I went to Steiner College because I'm, you know, heavy into anthroposophy medicine and plant anthroposophy, plant medicine and studies. 
And it all started with biodynamic farming. So 12 years ago, I went to the college and studied phenomenology and spiritual science and, you know, looking at things, you know, completely different. Um, and then this winter, I was lucky enough to take like five courses on some of the scientific work of Rudolf Steiner, which was actually pretty mind blowing. I'm really glad that for the esoteric science book that I actually had a teacher who had been studying this stuff for 30 years that could actually help to, you know, put it in a way that, you know, we could, the class, people in the class could broadly understand it, but it was such intense work that there was like 21 people that signed up for the online class weekly. And by the end, there was like four left. There was four of us left because so many people, it, it was tough. It was, it was such a tough class that, um, because it was dealing with time and space and, and how things are, were created more kind of like you know, almost like computer applications and, um, and, you know, you know, one, you know, reality was birthed out of another in the ether. And this is kind of like how planets were kind of arranged and, and, um, kind of, you know, how the human, you know, fits into a lot of the structure and, the different phases of consciousness that Steiner talks about. So, for example, you know, um, consciousness, you know, the mineral kingdoms and the water, they're still dealing with, it's a reflective consciousness. So whatever is actually, you know, the animals that are walking by and, and the plants that are growing um, and the humans that are walking by and the thoughts and the energy field is impacting the mineral kingdom and so they end up reflecting back what we're mirroring onto it right so it's like a house of mirrors kind of an aspect so we're getting back directly what we're projecting onto um and you know like with this whole time topic you know there's a lot of things that i've been studying that you know you know that i'm actually trying to piece together you know as well um, in my own construct, my new construct, <laughs> building my, have a construction site going. So, you know, I'm building a new, um, and then you have, you come to like the animal kingdom and Steiner talks about where they're at is called, um, a dreaming consciousness or a picture consciousness. So they are in that dreaming world mode, even though that they're physically awake, um, they're in that there's no separation between physical reality and the dreaming world, right? Um, and that kind of an aspect. And then you have the human, which has developed. And eventually, you know, we will eventually construct, you know, our reality. But right now, we're in what he calls the post, what's he call it? The post Atlantic, uh, the fifth epoch, which is the post Atlantean epoch. And he talks about how that started in 1410. And that it goes to 3572 and that it's actually the the thinking part of the dynamic of human beings that we're in what he's calling the thinking part where we're not just you know in the picture consciousness we're not in the reflective consciousness anymore and we're not in the picture consciousness anymore we're actually you know interacting and thinking about that interaction with the, with the reality, with these other previous consciousness that we would have inside of ourselves, the reflective and the, and the picture dreaming consciousness. Um, and so we're in the thinking part. We're going to be in the thinking part for quite a long time. But this is the period where we learn to actually create individualized thinking and individualized freedom, right? freedom in all aspects of our, our being as the human being so that, you know, we can evolve into the next epoch, the sixth epoch. And it's very interesting because, you know, this is not a collective period. This is, you know, an individualized period um, as the different humans start thinking about what is going on, what's in their reality, the outside world versus the internal world the different layers of consciousness that are embedded in us and what that freedom ultimately means to us. And eventually we'll be able to take it collective. 
Um, but I think, you know, it's it's not an easy thing. And so my teacher, you know, I'm, I'm always the bad student because I'm always asking the questions that nobody else wants to ask. <laughs> and That's they seem a good kind of, student. <laughs> they, they seems kind of confrontational. But um, so I asked my teacher, I said, so if we have all these beings, right, because Steiner talks about all these other unseen beings that are helping. There's negative ones that are, you know, using us, right? And then there's ones that are actually trying to help us to become free, right? A free being. And I said, so if there's all these great beings that are, you know, behind us and helping us, why would they let us collectively do what we've done to the earth? you know, as a living being, another living being, why would they let us, you know, do the destruction that we've done to it? And the thing that he said was like, just so I think about it all the time was that freedom is a tricky thing. Thinking and what that relates to individualized freedom and collective freedom is a tricky thing that you may have to destroy a whole planet in order to get the lesson. So it's kind uh, of let's just, try to avoid that. Right. But I mean, the thing is, it's like just very <laughs> interesting, you know, and and studying what Steiner talks about in the first section of esoteric science, which is, you know, all how everything was configured, you know, energetically and how things kind of morphed from one thing to another and how everything kind of went along. And it has a lot to do with chemistry. Like first there had to be carbon, right? Um, biological carbon, because carbon um, fixes the form. It, it creates the form, right? And then you had to have silica um, so that you could actually create a structure within that form. And Steiner talks a lot about, you know, so it's, it's just, you know, this whole thing about time is, um, you know, it has, I mean, it has just so many layers of, of aspects to it that, you know, we haven't really, like, you know, Stellium said, you know, we haven't really been taught these things. And everything that, um, you know, everything that is in our reality, historically, physically, geologically, um, everything has been told to us, right, to keep mm -hmm. us from actually thinking, right? And from trying questioning, to think, exactly. Right. And that's, you know, what a lot of the stuff is. Oh, yeah. Electric Thunder Universe. I've been watching those guys for a long time since they came out on YouTube. Um, but yeah, thanks for the links. I'll put those links up definitely for on the when we when we do the YouTube channel. But anyway, thanks for letting me kind of talk about Steiner. And like, I'm still trying to wrap my head around, you know, so much of this and, and time and put it into something that, you know, like I could have verbiage for you know like be able to actually communicate to other people so i really appreciate the conversation and everything that everybody's bringing to the dialogue um did you want to talk stellium on the mungo's jupe well one one thing i wanted to say related to what you were just saying and and the, to what i was talking about before is i mean we all have our our subjective experience of of time and you know and that that changes and flows based on our experience and what's in our heads at the time. And then there's this kind of big question as to whether or not with our consciousness, we can have an effect on the, on the world around us. And we obviously can, you know, affect our physical reality with tools and, and different, different approaches. But the question is, do we as individuals or as groups are are we actually having some kind of an effect on the on the physical world around us? And uh, you know, it's um, oh, it's the eight o'clock uh, clap for the police state uh, ritual. Sorry, <laughs> the sirens in the background. Um, so you know that that gets into I think you know uh, the whole the whole ideas of of relativity. Um, and it's just such a it's such a difficult thing to to really pin down and and uh, and discuss, especially when you start to talk about things like the dream world and shamanism and psychedelics and the implications of all all of those different subjects. 
it's a uh, it's a t it's a t tough to topic to say something meaningful about. Um, I put I put that link in the the chat. It's um, it's a video that uh, Mungo Jep from the Thunderbolts project did on instant fossilization, which has some interesting things in it. Relates to what we were talking about before, Lenny, um, when you were talking about what it would take, you know, for some kind of a transmutation to to occur. And Jep theorizes that uh, this is a direct quote, I think, that an abundance of neutrons, which are known to accompany lightning activity could be responsible for the transmutation. And he says that the only difference chemically between water, H2O, and calcium carbonate are additional neutrons. And that in the case of lightning or maybe high power plasma events, especially with plasma events, um, those are known to, to have an excess of, of neutrons and if those could be somehow embedded into the into the um, the water atoms then um, then that might you know explain mm -hmm. some kind of it you, you would know more about it than I obviously so, a, pla but a, so a plasma event could be a giant solar flare right yes it could be and it, it makes sense that that same dynamic between calcium carbonate and water extends on to uh, silicon dioxide also, which is the base of quartz. Yeah, and so <laughs> you can wow. see that the relationships are based on the geometry of the tetrahedron, which wow. is back to very, very basic alchemy. And in fact, I wonder really whether the whole field of chemistry shouldn't take a sub route and go back to the four basic elements air earth water and fire and mm. resolve things back again at that level because i think that the overlay of chemistry has pretty much ignored the physical reality of the four different uh phases of what we have we have the solid phase ice, the liquid phase, water, the gas phase, steam, but there's also a plasma phase, analogous to the water, which Jerry Pollack called the EZ phase. But if the electrons can move from entity to entity through the water and create a water being out of the sum of all water, in addition to each individual water molecule, well, isn't that the same pattern that I descri described when I set the limits of humanity at one individual human and all individual humans together? And so if we go out and look at astronomy and we look at all the stars and the, the planets and, and the energy out there, that's just another fractal of the same thing too, isn't it? Right. Yeah. And it's, it's it's a beautiful pattern. You've got all the cells in your body, independent. Well, first all the organelles in an individual cell, independently functioning alive. Then you've got the cells in your body, independently functioning alive, creating a, a bigger collective. The only the only caveat is I think if you start looking at the the being, the overmind created by the sum total of humanity, uh, I'm pretty sure that's the being we call Satan. <laughs> well I, you were just talking about uh the cells and then you know we go up to the next level which would be tissue tissue creates organ there's your there's another fractal level the organs combined in the cells you have the organelles then you have you know the nucleus and and the the cell as a whole and you have us as a whole so definitely uh there's a fractal um you know reoccurring pattern you you mentioned the the silicon um, transmuting to quartz. I think that's incredibly fascinating. In my fourth video on the the Titan series, I theorized that that um, in in both Titans and and smaller creatures that the fatty tissues are transmuted into quartz. And I don't know if you um, you know if you think about long chain fatty acids that go into um, creating the different 
the different oils and, you know, egg oil, uh, certain kinds of foods, they have these long chain fatty acids, which are kind of yellow in their nature. And so I'm theorizing that those are, those are transmuting to quartz whenever this high, high power event occurs, you know, whether it's lightning or plasma, I don't know, but I'm finding, I'm finding empirical evidence and then trying to figure out why, why it's there. <laughs> yeah. So one of the practices, you know, that we had in biodynamics, we use um, quartz, we grind it all up um, to create what's called the 501 preparation, which um, is used to increase photosynthesis, you know, on plants, we spray it on plants. We also spray it on um, say, for example, like, you know, it's colder out than it should be and you're, you can't get your product is still in the fields, you know, we'll spray the 501 on there to increase the photosynthesis um, so that the things can ripen faster based, you know, on a natural process, just increasing the photosynthesis on the leaves using the quartz crystals. Um, the finely ground product. And, you know, one of my teachers used to say that because of Steiner's work that there are elementals, right? There's also these beings that are inside a lot of the minerals in the mineral kingdom. And that also by, you know, it's this is kind of weird, but also by grinding down the quartz crystals, we're actually releasing these beings from kind of their um, entrapments, right? So that they can um, continue to actually do work from, you know, their kind of um, prison system, you know what I mean, that they've been trapped into. And I think that's kind of interesting, like as a fractal, and like if we talk about things collectively. Well, you know, Bridget, if you think about that, what would be their frame of time as those elementals? That would be a very, very long-lived time because they are set in a resonance structure of quartz that how long does quartz last in relationship to a human lifetime? So yeah. if you figure that that's another scale of time and that the beings that inhabit that scale of time are another fractal of human, that could be millions of years for an 80-year human lifetime. Right. So that's, I mean, that kind of happened. So in January, I was doing a, um, kind of more of a, like a shamanism type shattering release ceremony, worked on it for a month. And I started adding into it, um, elements, you know, gold and, um, silver. And then I, I really started to realize I really needed to focus in on the elementals. And so this goes back to the Steiner work I was doing this winter. And what I learned was that I can only have freedom if I offer freedom to someone or something else. So I ended up instead of um, breaking time. So this is kind of like the, the, the shamanism practice that I was working on was to shatter some things that are in this reality and this construct to open it up. So um, people can actually start thinking and paying attention to what's going on. Um, and, um, and so inevitably it became this, you know, I, I would hate to use the word ritual, but it became the ceremony where I actually gave freedom to all the elementals that were trapped in um, constructs or confinements that we would call minerals and gave them their freedom, gave them the choice of freedom. And through that whole thing that I did for like a month, I realized like I can't have freedom. I can't be unbound. I can't have choice unless I offer it to something or someone else. So it was kind of an interesting thing because, you know, it goes back to how long have they been trapped there? You know, how long have, have they been, you know, involved in, in that? And, and what happens if I give them freedom of choice? I mean, they know this world physically better than, than I could ever imagine. They've been here the longest, you know, they've seen everything. And don't they get to have a choice in what's happening here in this reality and, and about not being dragged along and just 
because they're trapped in the thing, you know, instead of having that mirror consciousness and just reflecting back to us what we send out, maybe they want to have a better role in what's going on and choices. But, you know, that's, I know my stuff's just kind of like so far out there. Um, and I apologize to anybody <laughs> listening to this, but um, yeah. So thinking about, you know, just at the basic fractals levels and time, you know, and the players in that and the people and the beings and people well, experiencing. You now get to the point where you realize that there are indeed multiple realities that coexist with us on this scale. And it's just that we've been unaware to recognize them, not that they haven't been there all the time. Well, that comes yeah. back to what I was saying before, is is that uh, we think that the nature of reality is this dead, stupid matter, but the nature of reality is mind. Mind underlies everything that we think is out there in the physical world. So, of course, it has consciousness behind it. Of course, it has beings attached to it. Of course, it spawns and splinters off into, you know, dreaming realities and different things because everything is mind. And the mind actually exists in nature, not in humanity, because nature is the mind of planetary scale, at least for this living Earth. And as far up as you want to go, except the whole thing about having a fractal, a nature, a, a reality whose nature is fractal, it just tells us that scale itself is cyclical. There is no upper end or lower end to scale. Right. It's a Mobius strip. And if we follow... The Zodiac, for instance, and assign the 2,000 years of each age where we're now we're into the age of Aquarius, we find that the 12 plus or minus 113 make up 26,000 years. I say plus or minus 1 because we always have to consider some error involved in our ability to discern, and on any scale... Once you define the scale like human scale, you can't have a half a human or a quarter of a human. You have to work with one human. So one human is the limit of the allowable error. And if it's one human with one human of error, that leads us from zero to two. If it's eight humans in a group, the error is at least seven, between seven and nine. But the whole numbers depend on the fractal that you begin your count on, and we can define the limits of any scale by having it as the individual and the collective. Awesome. Okay, so let's move into last arguments. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a last argument? No, I'm just kidding. Let's uh, let's move into the death struggle portion of this. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so, uh, uh, Ryan, do you have any final thoughts? We'll give everybody a chance. Oh man, yeah, there's been a lot of loose threads that I wanted to come back to, but um, let me just here's here's. This is my project, and I'm going to go back to what I was saying at the beginning. I'm at the very beginning of trying to understand time in the intensive way that I, I've set out to do because um, because it's a recent development that it, it's it's taken my interest in, in the way that it has. But time, you were talking about freedom earlier. I I really come to feel like freedom actually means freedom from time. Um, that's the ultimate one. Like I've, I've gone, I've chased, you know, I mean, government was an easy thing to, to call out, um, money, all, all of these different things. Oh, I was going to say that too. All of these different things that we are taught to take for granted and time more than anything, completely sloughed off, taken for granted. And it's, it's the way we're educated, right? I like to say, um, if you never want to have to think about something again, 
give it a name. Because that's what language does. It allows us to slough things off. We think that we talk, that we use language in order to actually achieve a finer understanding of things. But every time we name something, it's just, it's just a, an excuse to treat it out of hand, to be dismissive of it, to take it um, for granted because, you know, we have a name. We don't have to think about it ever again. So time, it's just this ignored thing, but it's actually, it's the key to everything. It's the key to our whole experience. It's the key to our whole slavery, and it's the key to freeing ourselves up. We need to heal our time. We need to get distance from our time and allow it to gradually open itself up to us. All right, there's my wrap up. (laughs) All right, Mr. Lenny, do you have any last words of wisdom? (laughs) <laughs> when you look at human scale and you try and assess true value, it seems that time is the true value. And as Ryan just said, we humans love to mar- marginalize it. But when we take our time to spend focused on individual things, that's when we make progress in the shaping of our reality. So each of us has our own individual reality. All of us have a consensus reality, but that consensus reality is what we're seeing breaking down because we can't even agree on some very basic definitions of what words mean. And so, as Ryan said, when you label something, you give it a form that allows you to write it off. Um, The collective we doesn't necessarily represent any part of the individual I. And any of us are allowed to deviate from the collective reality, but you can't do that the way the system is built. So I think we need to make way new systems in order to come up with concepts that are not accepted in the current reality because nobody's actually spent the time to think about such things. So I will be very interested in continuing the conversation again and each of us doing our own homework, meeting up and refreshing these ideas. The, The frequency that we resonate at is going to dictate the time constant that we're on, but I don't know anyone who can measure their own frequency. And in fact, that seems to be a variable based on the mood I find myself in on any given day. So that's something to think about. You you can't measure your own vibration because you're vibrating with it. It, There's no... (laughs) There's no relative. <laughs> anyway, sorry. No, you're okay. So I just want to put this out there is that um, Dr. Lenny and I are trying to um, get the collab back up and going. So we have at least a weekly topic or every two weeks or whatever it's going to be onto the collab. So um, we're putting it out that anybody interested in talking about a topic or further conversation about a topic, no matter who you are or where you come from, just let me know uh, your topic and then we'll try to bring a group together to actually discuss the topic and record it and we'll put it up on the think collab so we're trying to be kind of a collective right for information and um so yeah okay mr mr stellium seven you're up (laughs) (laughs) well as far as time goes i mean we've covered a lot of different aspects of it i there's there's no doubt there's a subjective experience of time and i think what lenny was talking about as far as a consensus experience of time and a consensus reality that's that's also true i i believe that there's also an objective uh flow of time and i'm not sure how those those all intertwine but i think that that the world around us has its own its own flow when it comes to time and i think that we've been misled um, either through mistakes or just flat out lied to about about fundamental aspects of our physical reality. And those have everything to do 
with the flow of time. Because when we look at geology, we're given these these time frames that have to do with hundreds of millions of years for the formation of different layers of strata and mountains and all of these things. And the geological timeline is used as a justification also for the astro astronomical timeline that's given to us by the astrophysicists. So those two things reflect back and forth on each other and they shape our perception of reality if, if you buy into to those models. And it also changes our relationship to the world around us because if you think about the the you know a lot of the the tribal um, communities they had a very different experience of the world you know they had animistic uh, faiths and and ways of looking at the rocks and the and the world around them that that things were imbued with with spirit and and that it was literally the ancients that they were walking around on and in in our modern world with our theories of evolution and the big bang and all of these things we're we're so divorced from a connection to the physical world around us because because of these these incredibly abstract numbers that that have no relationship to our own personal experiences as beings uh when it comes to the flow of time and it may be that the rocks are are thousands of years old and they, they may be biological in origin. And I think that's an incredibly profound thing. And a lot of people who've seen the videos that I produced have been incredibly thankful because they're, they're talking about how it's, it's shaped, the, it, it's altered how they perceive the, the world around them. And they have a much closer connection to, to nature as a result of that. And that, that's, uh, those, those kinds of comments give me, give me all kinds of motivation to, to keep going with, with the research and what I've done. Okay, all I'd like to add, thanks everybody for making the time, you know, to come and talk about time and maybe hopefully we'll have more conversations about time in the future. I just kind of want to leave people kind of with, you know, more of a, I guess, esoteric consideration. Um, so when you're dealing with like Tibetan Buddhism, there was a story that came out, I don't know, like eight years ago because the Chinese stole a mummified um, body of a Buddhist monk who had left his body and it was about 200 years but you know the chinese found one of the hidden caves there's a reason why they have hidden caves is because you know when a monk goes in there he may leave his body for a while the body may become mummified and then he goes and travels around and then as long as the body is untouched this is why when you they have the attendants they have an attendant that will go out and check on the monk um, to see what state that he's in, right? And if he needs food or water, but he can't go in, you know, he can leave food and water uh, inside. And then when he feels around in there, if the food and water has gone, then, you know, maybe the monk is rehydrated back into his, his mummified body. Now, if you move the body in any way, shape or form from the exact location, it's impossible for the monk to get back in the body. Mind you, monks spend most of their you know physical life working on these practices to bypass space and time so um i think it's interesting you know that they say that some so what they do is they keep record of all the different caves right that all the different monks are in and um they allow them to go through their process hundreds of years they you know travel they may even be in their physical body for years and years and years before they um, go out. And um, so they can be gone like 1,500 years in some cases. And so the, the lamas keep track of all this written record about who's what, who's in what caves, where they're at. And they don't mess around with the process of these monks. And I think like the longest I've heard of a monk that has left a body, the body's like in lotus position and it's a mummified body has been 1500 years. And then the monk comes back into the body, the body rehydrates and he comes back alive. Right. So these are things that have been going on with shamanic type people. And I'm not talking so much about dreamy medicines or LSD. Um, a lot of the traditional, um, 
a lot of the traditional approaches and different types of shamanism, we strictly stay away from those kinds of altered states. Um, but this is stuff that a lot of these ancient people that have these ancient systems and have these practices that are capable of doing. And you can find this stuff in articles. Um, and it also happens in Japan as well. <laughs> Sometimes you'll have a collective of monks that, um, that leave their bodies behind collectively as they're meditating. And I, I can't really pronounce the word, but I put a link in the chat box. Uh, so Duke and Naka something. But, um, and so this is like, you know, when we're talking about time and space, not only can these people bypass time and space, but their bodies can become mummified and then they can come back into the body and actually rehydrate it and come back alive, which I know goes against a lot of what people could even begin to wrap their heads around. But I just kind of wanted to leave that as a thought because, you know, if, if, if it is possible and there are people who have been doing this kind of stuff, then of course, everything that we've ever been taught, shown, educated in, in this reality is a complete and total lie. Well, I think I can concur that a lot of what they've taught us is a lie. But as we do our own individual homework and we think about the topic, what we come up with as an individual becomes our individual reality. And talking about it strengthens the bonds of that reality back to us as individuals. So I think in the last two hours, we've taken our four individual perspectives, two from a scientific aspect, two from a shamanistic aspect, and blended a model that considers all four of our realities into a physical reality that has legs to go on from here. But the story certainly isn't over. I think that there's a lot to be said about the physical reality of time on this earth being related to the organs that stellium seven has found and in fact as i sit here and look at the several different stones that i've pulled out in from my collection there's one that's obviously bone another a piece of jade that has what looks like lung tissue on it a piece of quartz that has crystallized in total amorphous shape so that you wouldn't even tell there was a crystal pattern. But on the one side, you can see waves, sort of like you'd see on uh, in the sea. Or if you look at your fingerprints, it's that type of relationship between the lines of fingerprint. I think that the reality consciousness is changing so that where we go from here is not necessarily dependent on where we have been as a society, but it certainly is worth keeping our heads up and looking at the world as something that is stuck in time, like Groundhog's Day, that until the current situation is resolved, time is standing still and we're dealing with the same issue day after day, because we're not grasping how important that issue is to the continuity of time moving forward. I'd just like to add something also. You were talking earlier, Lenny, about time being a Mobius strip. <clears throat> and the interesting thing about that is that the heart is also a Mobius strip. The heart is a toroid. And uh, I posted a link uh, in the chat that, to one of my videos called uh, Helical Hearts. And it's uh, talking about the work of a, of a scientist that lived here in Spain uh, who was a medical doctor. And he dissected thousands of hearts of all kinds of different species over decades. And he unraveled the Gordian knot, so to speak. Uh, he had a, 
an understanding of the way the heart was structured and how it functioned that was completely in uh, contradicting the mainstream beliefs about the heart, which actually still prevail. Most people think it's a, a four-chamber pumping system, and that isn't how the heart works at all. And this man proved it, but as always, science is very slow to catch up with with uh, certain certain understandings. But uh, the heart is is at the the center of our our lives, and it's also functioning basically as a singularity. It's a toroid, and it's it's a Mobius strip all in one, and that's what my my video Helical Hearts is all about. So I definitely recommend people check that out because. Um, it it ties in the the um, the heart stones and the the discoveries that I've made about those, and then it also um, relates it to to these ideas as well. And um, the heart is definitely the the metronome of the body, and it marks the passage of time with every beat. So um, as above, so below. And as I finished my last video with, I'd say to everybody. Keep your hearts soft because they function better that way. Hmm. Sounds like a coin bottle. A what? A Taurus and a. You said it's a Taurus and a Mobius band. You know what a Klein bottle is? A Klein bottle? No, that's a new term. How do you spell it? K L E I N. Klein bottle. Bottle. Yeah, look it up. It might interest oh, wow. you. It's well, it's <laughs> like a Taurus, but it's it's got a twisting action, which makes it contains a Mobius strip. It's um, that is very fascinating. Thanks for that. I hadn't seen that before. Well, one of the things that I that I show in that video that blew my mind, um, as he because because he was talking about the heart being uh, a toroid in its function and the way it it uh, it's not actually a pump. People think of it as a pump, but we have an estimated 60,000 miles of blood vessels in our body. And the, the prevailing paradigm when it comes to how the heart function is that, is that it's literally pumping the blood out to every little capillary in the body. And this medical doctor just, he said, that doesn't make any sense when you consider the high viscosity of blood and, you know, um, blood vessels that are getting narrow and narrower. It doesn't make any sense that a, a heart, a, a pump the size of your fist could supply so many miles of blood vessels. And then on relaxation, it's supposed to just passively fill with blood. It, it didn't make any sense to him. And that, that questioning led him to discoveries that are truly monumental and he should have gotten the Nobel Prize. And, and, uh, and it's still not really even understood or adopted by cardiologists to this day. There's a small number of them that really understand the ramifications of his discoveries. But um, in the process of, of dissecting one, uh, one of these hearts on video, when I watched him do it, the heart is essentially a rope. It's a big, long, flat band. It's all one continuous piece, and it's not four different chambers that fire in a certain order like we're taught to believe, it doesn't function that way at all. And he proves that un unequivocally. But he, he dissects this heart with his hands, and he rolls it open into a, a flat band. But in the process of rolling it back up, he does this half twist right at the center of it. And that's how a Mobius strip is made. You take a flat piece of mm -hmm. paper, you do a half twist, and you attach them at the ends, and essentially what you end up with is a is a one-sided three-dimensional object <laughs> where you can just trace the side around, and it just keeps coming back to where you started. And and it's uh, so I, I I covered that in the video, but cool. this is really um, cool. I'll check this bottle out. That's awesome. <laughs> as a as a little side request, you might uh, send Bridget that link. Yeah, I already put it in. For the show notes? I put it in the chat. Oh, uh, the heart yeah, I video? Put, yeah, oh, I don't yeah, know why. None of, oh, you did? <laughs> I don't know. Every, I'll have to go back and look, but hopefully it's there. Um, but we have it in the okay. chat on Skype, so I'll make sure that it's in there. And then when I put the video up, I'm going to, as soon as we're done, I'll upload it onto the Think Collaborative, and then I'll add all the links in the box below of the video, and then I'll send everybody a link that was in the chat today so that you guys all have it. Yeah, for some cool. reason in the chat, the, the videos that I posted didn't have um, um, 
they didn't have any previews. So they just had the links. So I don't know why that happened. Yeah, but no um, worries. I'll, Lenny, I'll, I'll put them all up and then I'll label cool. them. You know, when I Lenny, put them up. Lenny shared my most recent video, which was a part two of a series called Petrified Titans and Organs, and uh, I'm sharing part one now. And those two videos um, combined, it's less than an hour's worth of material, and that, that's a summary of, of the last two years of research that I've done in those two videos. And then uh, if people are interested in knowing the details, then they can go into the playlists and, and watch the, the different series in order. Um, yeah. It would be worth your while okay. to note what the uh, current video usage is on those and see how many people actually come from this presentation in the next couple days to view the videos. Okay, I'll check. I'll watch the analytics. Um, I. It's been an interesting uh, month because um, I had. Um, I was just about to release that video a, a few weeks ago, and Simon Dan, who is a, he's anything but scientific, really. He's a he's he's a huge troll. He's got about four hundred thousand followers. He came across my stuff and decided to do a hit piece on it, and uh, that that was quite an experience. It attracted literally thousands of trolls and um, a whole lot of negativity. <laughs> so. Um, it was it was interesting because even his his video was attracting new subscribers. Um, but with my most recent video, which has been the second best performing video I've ever done, um, and also um, has um, had you know quite a lot of views and overwhelmingly thumbs ups, um, it's it's resulted in almost no new subscribers. So I think after Simon Dan's attention, I I may have. Uh, gotten shadow banned finally because every time I've released a video it's resulted in hundred hundreds of new subscribers and I think I've had less than 40 since that one came out um, yeah yeah and I'm, then the queen of, I'm the queen of shadow ban so I only have 500 people on my channel and I've had it since 2008 <laughs> <laughs> yeah I noticed when I was doing my work on steam it that I was keeping track of the growth rate, and when it hit 360, it then stayed plus or minus five within that number for the next four months. So I think that all the analytics that we deal with involve a process of shadow banning anything they don't like, but yeah. we need to figure out the analytics that we can use to track progress and fortunately, on human scale, those are the very low numbers. Yeah, it is. I, I did an interview with SGT Report, and that's a big channel, 600,000 subscribers. And um, that, that interview got, I think, 80,000 views on his, on his channel. And it doubled my channel as far as subscribers. I had something like 4,000 new subscribers from that one, that one interview. Um, so it's it's definitely there was a steady growth with every video I released and and um, but this this one is <laughs> suspiciously low and also when I put out uh, after the fourth video on the mountain that I did um, Google Earth went in and edited the mountain and they blocked out the eye and the ear so the only portions of the mountain that have been edited uh, by Google Earth um, were the ones that I did three videos on. And and I show in the fifth video uh, unequivocal evidence of their censorship because I show all of the different angles and, and I had done a lot of footage using Google Earth, um, kind of zooming in slowly and coming at different angles, um, you know, just for the visuals on the mountain. And then um, I was in an interview with a, a guy named Rodrigo Ferrari Nunez, and I was going to show him, uh, you know, go in live and and just kind of give him a tour of the mountain. And that was when we both re realized that the the eye had had literally been kind of uh, you can almost see that it's been done by hand. And uh, yeah, so that's an interesting video just in and of itself because of the before and afters that that I show of. Uh, 
what the mountain used to look like for two years straight because I I'd been in literally hundreds of times examining it from all these different angles and using it for filming purposes and then and then one day from one day to the next it's it's been edited and blocked and now you can't you can't do what I did anymore unfortunately so if people don't watch the videos they they can't see for themselves well there goes that I mean that's the whole thing right so you know we start expanding out of this you know time continuum and then they decide to like um, edit it <laughs> like <laughs> Create new borders, right? More boundaries and borders. <laughs> it's like, well, what? and considering the subject was time, I think it's kind of funny. Neither none of us brought up the Mandela effect or or the possibility of time travel. And uh, and if either one of those things are are a reality, then then we've all got a lot to worry about because it doesn't really matter what we do. They can just go back in time and start changing stuff around, and you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's a sword that cuts both ways. I uh, well, when I when I was talking with Bridget about having this, uh, well, I I wasn't actually suggesting it as a collab uh, topic. That was her idea, but I was talking about time because I had gotten interested in it. Um, I don't know if any of you probably have read uh, Slaughterhouse Five, Kurt Vonnegut. Years ago, I just remember Ice Nine. Yeah. Do you, um, you remember, I don't even remember the main character's name, but he, he's unstuck in time, which, so the book, you know, gives his, you know, experiences in his life all out of order, but that's the way he experiences it. He just bounces around in time. It's not. It's not time travel where he's changing the past or anything like that, but he experiences his life in just a random chaotic order. Mm. And, you know, he has a weird life anyway because he's in the war and the bombing of Dresden, and then later he gets abducted by aliens and all sorts of weird <laughs> shit happens. But um, uh, that's exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I'm talking about expanding your perception of time. Um Meaning that, yeah, you might not experience consistently the same probability stream all the time. You might bounce around. I know I have. Hmm. All right. Well, on that note, um, Lenny and I have. <laughs> well, Lenny and I oh, have okay. a class at one o'clock today that we have to record, and um, so uh, we have about an hour and ten minutes to have lunch and whatever else we're gonna do. Um, walk the dog in my case. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to end it. I'm going to stop the record. But hey, everybody, you know, thank you so much for coming on and having. Um, obviously, it was a good conversation because everybody had input all the way to the very end. So it's really good. But it's the Think Collab. Today is April 12th, 2020. And um, we had Dr. Lenny Time, Mike Stellium 7 YouTube channel. Um, Ryan Hunter and me, Bridget Lynn Dolgoff, and um, look, look. Hopefully, we'll get the Think Collab back up and going, uh, so that we have actually new content. So, if anyone has any ideas about a topic that they want to share, um, let me know. Uh, let us know, and um, we can put that topic together and get a team of panelists <laughs> to discuss it. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks everybody, and have a great day.